Hey everybody, welcome to the test four review for college algebra. So let, we've got 10 questions that cover 5.1 through 5.5. So here we go. Now some of these questions, they're gonna be very, very involved, ladies and gentlemen. So you need to make sure that you pay attention to um, each question and how they are worded because the wording is very, very similar across some of these questions. So be careful as you start reading through these. So here we go. So first question coming from 5.1. So we're gonna find the form of a polynomial whose zeros are given and the degree. And uh, we're gonna type in the polynomial with integer coefficients and a leading coefficient of one in the space below. And since that leading coefficient is one, that means they are telling us that our a value is one. Okay, so we've got zeros that are negative three, three, and one, and we have a degree that is three. All right, so here's what we know. And because, again, they told us that, that the leading coefficient was one, that's what a is gonna equal. Because if you remember, when we write this, the form of this polynomial is gonna look like this. A, parenthesis, x minus your first zero, times x minus your second zero, times x minus your third zero. This is what we call intercept form of a polynomial. So this a is what I was talking about with this leading coefficient. So we plug it in, a is one, x minus the first zero is negative three, so I put negative three, and we all know that a negative by a negative is really a positive. So that's what it looks like when we plug in the first zero. And then we have x minus three, and then x minus one, plugging in the rest of our zeros as we go along. Now, they do want your polynomial in standard form, which means we need to go ahead and come in here and FOIL everything out. The cool thing is taking one times this first parenthesis isn't gonna do anything. So we can really just ignore the one and all we gotta do is focus in on our three parentheses right there. So we're gonna FOIL these first two. So X times X is X squared. X times negative three gives us negative three X. Three times X gives us a positive three X and three times negative three gives us a negative nine. Okay, I'm gonna put that in parentheses. Cleaning up a little bit, the two middle terms get together and that leaves us with X squared minus nine and we're gonna multiply that by X minus one. So we're gonna FOIL this information out now. And once we FOIL this out and combine like terms, if we have any, that will be the final answer for the polynomial that they want. So what is X squared times X? That's X cubed. What is X squared times negative one? Negative one X squared or just negative X squared, it's your call. Negative nine times X is negative nine X and negative nine times negative one is a positive nine. Since there are no like terms getting together, that right here is the final answer. X cubed minus one X squared or minus X squared minus nine X plus nine. And that is question one. Moving on to question two. So let's jump back in, let's take a look. So question two, there are multiple parts to this. Um, all this information is again coming from a combination of 5.1. And I don't think we're looking for a graph on this because I don't think it continues, nope. So this is all coming again from 5.1. We're talking about all those basic ideas 
where we got to find the real zeros and their multiplicities. Determine whether we touch or cross, which is all about multiplicities. Determine the number of max turning points. And then we talk about its end behavior. And the way we talk about its end behavior is by knowing what the power function is. Okay. So this is all the information we would gather before we would actually try and graph this as what 5.2 was about. So let me write down our function. And let's start finding out information. Okay. So I have the function written down. So the first thing we need to do is we need to find the first term for this polynomial. Okay. Because we need the first term because that's going to tell us the leading coefficient and the degree. And the way that you find the first term is we're going to take and we're going to multiply the negative 9 times the first piece in each of these parentheses. Now, please know that this parenthesis right here is squared. So you do need to write both of them out. So it really looks like this. That's the true polynomial we're working with. They condensed it down by saying that this was squared, but you need to expand those back out. So again, as I said, to find that first term, we're going to take the negative 9 times the first piece in each of those parentheses. So we're going to take negative 9 times x times x times x. Negative 9 times x times x times x. And when you multiply all that together, you get negative 9x cubed. This is what we need in order to answer some of our questions that are a little bit later on. Okay? So the first thing you want to do after you get that polynomial is find that first term because we need this first term to answer some of our questions. Okay? So let's start answering the questions on this number two problem. So the first thing says, talk to us about the real zeros. All right. It's easy enough. So the real zeros, that's what's great about this. This is already factored. So zeros is just another fancy way of saying, find me the x-intercepts. Okay? So the x-intercepts just means that we set this, all this information equal to zero. So we got zero equals negative nine, x plus six, x plus five, and x plus five. I like to keep it all expanded out, okay? So since this is all factored, in order to solve for the x-intercepts, all you do is you set each piece equal to zero. So negative nine equals zero, but does that make sense? Nope, so you ignore it. Then you take x minus six equal to zero, and you add six to both sides, and you find out that x is six. So there's one of our zeros. That's one of our x-intercepts. And if you think about x-intercepts, if they want it written as a point, because it says ordered pair, it would be six comma zero. <clears throat> we take the x plus five and set it equal to zero. And you subtract five to both sides. You can find out that we have another x-intercept of negative five. Again, if they want the ordered pair, it'd be negative five comma zero. Sometimes they just ask for the integers. Sometimes they actually ask for the points. So just make sure that you read that fine print. And right here are the zeros. Okay? So if we go back to our question, in this blank, it just says give us the exact answers. Use commas to separate. So we would just put 6, 5. Negative 5, sorry. So the next piece to this, part B, says... Well, obviously we have zeros, so we would be selecting A. You wouldn't worry about that. So part B says, actually it's kind of combined some questions right here. Um, so you're either selecting A or B, but then we have to answer these two questions right here. All right. Uh, so it's kind of got smushed together there. So there technically is 
this part right here, A and B, is the first question, but that first question also has a follow-up because it now wants to know the multiplicities. So the multiplicity, if you remember, going back, is all about the powers on the parentheses. So if we look at this parentheses right here, there's a power there. Even though it's not written in, there's that imaginary one. So the power for the uh, x-intercept of 6 was 1. And that is odd. That's important for us. We look at the power for the x plus 5, and that's 2. Okay? So that is even. And multiplicities work like this. Remember that if the power was odd, that means you're going to come down and cross at the x-intercept. If the power was even, that means you would come down and touch the x-intercept. Kind of like tag. Tag, you're it. Run away. Okay? So this is the information that they want to help us answer the next couple questions. So let's jump back. So what was the multiplicity of the larger zero? It was one because that was our six. Okay, so it had a power of one. What was the multiplicity of the smaller zero, which was negative five? It was two. So they were just asking for those powers. Okay, so then part B says the graph blanks touches or crosses the larger intercept. Well, remember, the larger intercept was 6. It was odd, so that means we're going to cross. The graph blanks, touches, crosses the x-axis at the smaller intercept. Well, the smaller one was negative 5. Its multiplicity was even, so it's going to touch. Okay? So that's exactly what we talked about right here. So there was the, this was the uh, multiplicity for the larger intercept. This was the multiplicity for the smaller intercept. This is what's going on at the x-axis for the larger intercept. This is what's going on at the x-axis for the smaller intercept. Okay? Boxing in all those answers for you. All right. Let's jump to the next question. See, almost done. So the next one says, what is the maximum number of turning points? All right, turning points. So the graphs have at most the degree minus one turning points. Okay, so this is why we have that first term here, okay? Because the first term is going to hold the degree of the polynomial. Degree, again, is the highest power. What's the highest power of our polynomial? It's going to be 3. So this polynomial will have at most 3 minus 1 turning points, or in other words, it will have at most two turning points. So in that blank in there, on our review, you would put the number two. Okay? That's the maximum number of turning points. And the last one, it says, write the power function that resembles um, what the graph is going to do. This is the end behavior question. And the power function, super easy. It's the first term. So that's why we had to find that first term, because this is actually the answer to the last question. This first term right there is also the power function, which tells us how our graph is going to behave, okay? 
And that right there is the answers for two. Got to know that vocabulary in here. All right. Let's head up question three. So question three. So looking at this one, just want to make sure. So it's only one page. So it wants to know, is this graph right over here, is this a polynomial? Okay. And then if it is a polynomial, it says, tell us the real zeros, which means x-intercepts, and state the least degree of the polynomial. All right. So first things first, to be a polynomial graph, To be a polynomial graph, you are what we call smooth and continuous, which means no holes and no sharp corners. Okay. So if we go up here, in other words, uh, um, as long as I don't have any like sharp points, you know, like an absolute value type graph, we're okay. A hole, you would see an open circle and then your graph would pick up somewhere else. To be smooth and continuous, your pen should be able to follow the graph and without lifting up and out stopping because of a corner, your graph would flow nice and smoothly and continuously. And so you saw my cursor run along the graph and this graph is smooth and continuous. So this is a polynomial function. Because the graph is smooth and continuous. So we would select A, okay? And now you look up here and you find the zeros. That's the x-intercepts. So where is my graph crossing the x-axis? Well, it crosses right here, and that is at negative 2. And it crosses right here, which is at a positive 2. And finally, it crosses at a positive 5, okay? Under the next piece says, what is the least degree of a polynomial? Okay. So showing you what I have written down right here to talk about it. So here's everything I just talked about. Polynomial graphs are smooth and continuous, no holes and no sharp corners. So we know that it's a polynomial graph. Here are those zeros we just talked about. The at least degree of a polynomial equals the number of zeros. So if we look at our number of zeros we have, we have one, two, three. So that means the at least degree is three. That means the smallest power our polynomial could have, the height, I know this is weird, the highest power that our polynomial could have as the degree is three or more. That's what this is saying. Okay. Remember degree means the highest power. So that means our polynomial could be of degree three, could be of degree four degree five, we just would need more information, okay? That's what this means. So now you know what goes into that final blank. The at least degree for that polynomial we have here is three, okay? And that's question three. Moving on to question four. And again, this is coming from section 5.1. Everything so far has been in 5.1. So now moving on to section 
5.3. Okay, so notice we don't actually have to worry about a section 5.2. Um, 5.1 was enough. All right, so in here, we want to know which picture down below is the rational function. And then we want to know the domain and the range. And then we want to know um, if it has any vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, or oblique asymptotes. Okay? Well, this first piece is pretty easy. Go to the calculator to find which graph it is. So we're just going to go to our calculator and we're going to put in this negative 3 over x minus 5. So I bring up my calculator. We're going to go into y equals because it's a function. We're going to push negative alpha y equals. There's our fraction. 3 over x minus 5. Graph. So there's what it looks like. We just now got to think about this picture. Which one on our exam matches this guy? So there's this one, which is quite a possibility. This guy, no, because it's over here on the negative side, so you can cross out C. Well, it could be 20, or it could be B, because it looks like both of these have them on the same side. We definitely know it's not D, because it's just like C. It's got you know the graph on the wrong side because our graph is over here all on the positive side okay of the x-axis so we need to know the difference is does it swoop up and then on the other side swoop around the the negative part or is it swooping on the negative part and then swooping on the the positive part okay so let's go to our graph so it's swooping on the positive piece up here first the up and then it's down so if we go back and we look at our pictures, A is the choice because this is the one that looks like the picture. It's in the top half first and then it's in the bottom half. So A is the graph of that one. And now we can start answering questions. And so we can start looking at this and we can talk about our domain. And actually, we don't even need to look at this to find the domain, but we will look at this to help us find the range here in a second. But as far as our domain goes, we can go look at the equation to find the domain because this is rational. How do you find the domain of a rational? You set the denominator equal to zero and solve. Okay? So x minus 5 equals 0. So x is equal to 5. That means our domain, written in set notation, we like every number but 5. So we're throwing that out. That right there is the domain. Now to get the range, let's go look at our graph. Okay? So, if we go look at our graph, this right here is a horizontal asymptote, okay? So, our lines are getting really, really close to the x-axis from above, and, the, and they're getting really, really close to the x-axis from below, okay? We're just not going to touch the x-axis right here, because that's a horizontal asymptote. So what are the values of the range, which are all about y values, that allow uh, um, the range to exist? And notice my graph is dipping down, so that means my graph keeps going down and down and down and down. So all the negative values of the y exist. And then again, up here, my graph is on the, the positive side shooting straight up, so that means all the positive y values exist. Again, where is there the problem? It's that horizontal asymptote because remember, we, we're not going to cross that horizontal asymptote. Okay? So that means that we like every number in the range, but when y is zero because that's the horizontal asymptote here. So our range 
through exploration of our graph is we like every number but zero because we're getting really, really close to zero from the top, but we're not going to touch it. We're getting really, really close to zero from the bottom, but again, we're not going to touch that y or that x-axis, which represents the y value is zero. So there's the range that we just talked about. We like every value but the zero. Okay? So if we go in and we're looking at this information, so we would choose C for the domain here, and we would put in the number five. For the range, oh, we gotta continue on to the next page because it was just too large of a page. For the range, we would choose C and put in the number zero, okay? And then now down below, it wants to know, do we have a vertical asymptote? Do we have a horizontal asymptote? Or do we have, again, this one continues on the next page, an oblique asymptote, okay? So let's talk about those real quick. Oops, too far. So jump over here to our page. So vertical asymptotes, to find those, again, it's just like domain. All we're gonna do is set the denominator equal to zero. So we're going to take x minus 5, set it equal to 0. x is equal to 5. So we do have a vertical asymptote, and it's x equals 5. So if we come back to our problem, the vertical asymptote, well, we don't have two of them. We only have one, so we're going to select b, and we're going to write x equals 5. See, it says equation, and you need to write x equals 5 because it is a vertical line. Now, horizontal asymptotes and oblique asymptotes, in order to find those, you have to look at it as a case-by-case -case basis, okay? So, you, we're either going to have a horizontal or an oblique or none of them, and in order to do this, you need to look at the numerator degree or the and the denominator degree, not an or, it's an and. So the numerator degree, if we look at our problem where there's no variables, so there's no power, so that means the numerator degree is zero because there's no variable with a power up here, so that's zero. The denominator degree is one. <clears throat> so there were four cases that you had to think about here. Case one was when the numerator was less than the denominator. And that's what we have here. We have case one. When the numerator degree, which I'm going to abbreviate ND, is less than the denominator degree. And since we're in this case, it will have a horizontal asymptote and that horizontal asymptote will always be y equals zero whenever you're in case one it is a horizontal asymptote and y equals zero and since we have a horizontal asymptote that means that there is no oblique asymptote or we have none and that's how we answer the rest of these questions okay so we go back in and we look at the question. So do we have two horizontals? No, we only have one. And then here we'll put y equals zero. So you select B, put y equals zero. And then scrolling over to the last question. So because we had a horizontal asymptote, we're gonna select C for no oblique because you can't have both. You get one or the other. And that is question four from section 5.3. All right, here is another question from, well, actually, this one is coming straight from uh, the same section, actually. So this is another 5.3 question, okay?
another 5.3 question. So we're going to follow this the same way that we just did a moment ago. Okay, I'm going to go to my calculator. I'm going to plug in our function and we're going to check for the asymptotes. Okay, um, so I was looking at this just for a second and I noticed that this is a little off. There should actually be a symbol between here and it should be a plus. So this is what the real equation looks like um, for this one. It's negative 5 plus 3 over x plus 4 and then that piece is squared. Okay, so this is the real um, rational that we need. And this is what I'm going to put in my calculator. Okay, and it's just like what we just did a second ago. This is the same kind of problem that's coming from 5.3. All right, so go into my cal calculator. Let's get rid of what we just had. And it is negative 5 plus alpha y equals. And it is 3 over x plus 4. And that's going to be squared. Okay, and we hit graph. And just like before, all I'm going to do is I'm going to see which picture looks just like this. Okay? So we go into our page. And if we look at these, there's only one picture that looks like what we just had in our calculator. So there it is. It should be down here in quadrant three. So when I look at my pictures... This is the guy that has it in quadrant three. So the graph is choice C. Okay. So let's find the domain on this. So the domain, again, all we have to do is look at the equation to find the domain. Okay. So in order to do that, we set the denominator equal to zero which our denominator is x plus 4 squared equal to 0. So we're finding that domain, which means that there are two of these, x plus 4, x plus 4. And since they're both the same, we really only have to do one of them. Okay? So x plus 4 equals 0. So we're going to subtract 4 in our domain in set notation, we are throwing out x not equal to negative 4. So that's our domain. The range, I will do just like what we did a moment ago. We're going to go in, and the range is about y values. We're going to go in, and we're going to look at the calculator, and we're going to see what's going on here. So notice that our y values, all these positive values are good, we're still good, and it's like all of a sudden we hit this little piece right here, and that's at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's a horizontal asymptote that exists here. You see how it's kind of leveling out? That's how I know it's a horizontal asymptote. So right here at negative 5 for the y values, it's like our graph stops. It won't go past that. So what that means for us in the range is that we like all these values that are above negative 5. So if we're writing that up, that means that our range, we like all the values above, which means that it's greater than negative 5. Don't put an equal to because we don't like negative 5. You won't touch negative 5. You'll get really, really close to it. But don't touch it, just like annoying siblings will do. Be like, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. That's what's going on at negative 5. The graph's going to get really, really close to it, but not cross it. And that right there is the range. Again, I just look at the graph and have it tell me what the range is. So if we go in here, we already know that this was choice C. In B, we would put choice C and put in a negative 4 right there. Then we got to go to the next page. For the range, we would choose choice A because we want to be greater than, and then we put negative 5 right there. Okay? And then now all we have to do is talk about whether there are asymptotes, vertical, horizontal, or oblique. Okay? So let's go talk about those. 
All right. So in order to find the asymptotes, okay, the vertical, all we're going to do is take and set the denominator equal to zero, very much like what we did for the domain. So x plus 4 squared equals 0. That really means x plus 4, x plus 4. And since they're both the same, you only have to do 1. And then you subtract the 4 from both sides, and you find out that you have a vertical asymptote at negative 4. Okay? So we go out here, and for the vertical asymptote question, we will choose choice B because there's only one, and we'll put X equals negative four. Okay? And then now we gotta talk about horizontal asymptotes and oblique. All right, now this one. You gotta be careful because in our problem, we have two pieces here, and we really do need to put these things back together. Okay? That means we need to put these rationals back together. So, that's negative 5 over 1 plus 3 over x plus 4, x plus 4. I like to expand that out. And remember what you learned in intermediate algebra. In order to add rationals or subtract rationals, you have to have common denominators. Well, what's the common denominator between these two? It's going to be x plus 4, x plus 4. Plus x plus 4, x plus 4, okay? That's the common denominator. So here's the denominator I currently have. Here's what I need. So what am I going to multiply 1 by to get x plus 4, x plus 4 up here? I'm going to multiply it by an x plus 4, x plus 4. And if I multiply the denominator by that, I have to also multiply the numerator by it. So up here in the numerator, I have negative 5 times x plus 4, x plus 4. Over here, I have x plus 4, x plus 4. I need x plus 4, x plus 4. So it matches. So that means the numerator is going to stay the way it is because they already match. So in the end, we have this. Our x plus 4 stays, because when you add and subtract fractions, the denominator stays the same. And on top, we've got negative 5 times x plus 4, x plus 4, plus 3. Now, what we need to do is we need to actually multiply all this out, because in order to find horizontal and oblique asymptotes, I have to know what is the degree of both the numerator and the denominator, okay? In order to find oblique asymptotes, I need to know the degree of both the numerator and the denominator. So we're going to do some foiling up here. I'm going to take negative 5 times x times 4. That gives us negative 5x minus 20. And I'll multiply that times the x plus 4. Well, negative 5 times x is negative 5x squared. Negative 5 times 4 is negative 20x. Negative 20 times x is negative 20x. Negative 20 times 4 is negative 80. And then we have a plus 3 on the end. In the denominator, we're going to take x times x, and that gives us x squared. Then x times 4, which gives us a plus 4x. 4 times x, which gives us a plus 4x and 4 times 4, which gives us a plus 16. Combining like terms, in the numerator, we get the negative 20s together, which gives us negative 40x. And we also put together the constant terms, which gives us negative 77 in the numerator. Denominator, Put those two guys together, and we get x squared plus 8x plus 16. So this is really the f of x that we're working with. 
And now we can talk about the horizontal asymptote and the oblique asymptote. So in order to work this, again, we need the numerator degree, which is now 2, because that's the highest power. We need the denominator degree, which is 2. So now you go by a case-by-case -case basis. Case 1 was when the numerator degree was less than the denominator. We do not have that. Case 2 is when the numerator degree equals the denominator degree. And that's what we have. We have a case 2. So that means you're going to have a horizontal asymptote. And in order to find that horizontal asymptote, you're going to give me the leading coefficient of the numerator. And you're going to put it over the leading coefficient of the denominator. Again, why we needed to do all that foiling and everything. So now when we look at this, y is equal to, what's our leading coefficient of the numerator? That's this guy right there. Negative 5. What's the leading coefficient of the denominator? That's this guy that's right there, the invisible one. So we find that the horizontal asymptote is y equals negative 5. And because we have a horizontal asymptote, that means there is no oblique. So let's go in and let's talk about those answers now for the horizontal and the oblique. So the horizontal, we would choose 1, and it would be y equals negative 5. And then down here for the oblique, you would choose none because it doesn't exist. And that is question 5. Let's jump into question 6. So this one, it just wants to know, are there any vertical, horizontal, or oblique? So again, this is 5.3. So are there any horizontal, um, oblique, or um, vertical asymptotes? So again, vertical asymptote, we know how to find that. So all we're going to do is set the denominator equal to 0. Let me write down our function, r of x equals 3x over x plus 12. So the good thing is we don't have to do half as much work. Oh, let me just clear this out. Half as much work as what we just did a second ago. Okay. So we're going to take our denominator, set it equal to 0. So x plus 12 equals 0. Subtract 12 from both sides. We find out that there is a horizontal asymptote. Sorry, vertical asymptote and it's x equals 12. Let's get the horizontal asymptote or the oblique asymptote and then we'll talk about uh, the answers here in just a second. So again, we go by case by case basis. We don't have to worry about any multiplying or anything like that. So we need the numerator degree, which is one because that's the power on the x there. We need the denominator degree, which is one as well because that's the power on the x there and again we're right back to what we just did a second ago we are in case two so all we need to do and we know that it's going to be a horizontal asymptote so all we need to do is find the leading coefficient of the numerator put it over the leading coefficient of the denominator so the leading coefficient of the numerator is three the leading coefficient of the denominator is 1. And when you reduce 3 divided by 1, you get 3. And since we have a horizontal asymptote, there is no oblique asymptote. So when we go back and look at our question, there is one vertical asymptote. So we have x equals negative 12 here. There is one horizontal, and you put y equal 3. And because there is a horizontal, when we talk about the oblique, we say that there is no oblique because we have a horizontal. And that is question six. All right, let's jump into question seven. 
So question seven, this comes from 5.4 and we are going full on graphing for this one, okay? So we're gonna be answering a lot of questions. We're gonna talk about their zeros. We're gonna talk about the domain. We're gonna find vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, all sorts of information, okay? So let's tackle this guy. So the first thing it talks to us about, it says, we need to uh, write the given function as a single rational expression. So down here, it needs to be, um, my answer needs to be in factored form, okay? Um, so in order to write it as a single rational expression, it says factor the numerator and denominator, and then it, then what it wants you to do is it wants you to do any reducing, or actually right now, do not reduce. So this question right here is, um, the answer is actually right there. It already gives us the answer. It is already factored up here, okay? And this is what it wants for part A. So part A just wanted to take this and factor it. Good news is, it's already done. So we've got x plus 2 all over x, x plus 9. And that's what's going to go on this blank. x plus 2 all over x, x plus 9. Okay, now it says find the domain. So all we do is we take that denominator and set it equal to zero, okay? So we're gonna take and find the domain now. So we take that x, x plus nine equal to zero. Since it's already factored, separate them and set them equal to zero. So we find right here, this is one of the numbers we're getting rid of, which is zero. Subtract nine from both sides, and we find out that x is equal to negative nine. So our domain is, we are throwing out negative nine, and we are throwing out zero. And there is the second answer to the question. So we come back in here. So we're looking at this, what's the domain? So we come right up here, we select A, we put in negative nine, put a comma, and then put a zero. Now the next one says, go ahead and reduce that. Okay, so they want us to reduce our rational, if we can. Well, there's no canceling out in here. No, you cannot cancel out these x's because this x plus 2 is all together. This plus means that this is kind of like a giant family up here. The only way you're going to cancel out this x right here is if you had an x plus 2 in the denominator down here. And the same thing, the only way we're going to cancel this x out right here is if we had an x in the top. So there's actually no um, canceling. So this is both, this is also the simplified form. So when we go back to this question right here, what's the new form where well, there isn't one? We want to select B because it's already in its lowest terms. Okay. So there's the answer to this one. There's no simplifying because it's ready to go. Now we want to locate the intercepts. That means it wants the X intercepts and the Y intercepts. Okay. So <clears throat> let's go back to our problem and let's start talking about intercepts, all right? So the x-intercept, easy to deal with. With the x-intercept, all you're going to do is set the numerator equal to zero and solve, okay? So x plus two equals zero. So we have an x-intercept at negative two. Or again, if we write it as a point, it would be negative two comma zero. So there's our x-intercept. To find the y-intercept, all you're gonna do is plug in zero for x and solve, okay? So zero plus two all over zero times zero plus nine. Okay, so zero plus two is equal to two. And again, we're solving for the y-intercept. Zero plus nine is nine. And zero times nine is zero. 
And if you go to your calculator, take two divided by zero, it can't do that. So we find out that there's actually no y-intercept because this doesn't exist. And that makes sense because we threw out x equal to zero right there in the domain. So we only have an x-intercept at negative two. So when we go in here, so graph has an x-intercept, y-intercept, nope. Graph has a y-intercept and no x-intercept, that's not true. So right here, we're gonna select C because the graph has an x-intercept and no y-intercept, and we're gonna put negative two in here, okay? Now, down below, it wants to know what's gonna happen at the x-intercept. Well, it's gonna cross it, okay? Because usually we will always cross the x-intercepts. So down here, you can just come in and you're going to select C because we will cross at that x-intercept, guaranteed. Okay. All right. So you select C and put the graph will cross at the x-intercept too because it's an x-intercept. We're going to cross it. All right. Don't worry about touching. It's not going to touch in these. It's going to cross. All right. Now we want to know about vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes and oblique asymptotes. All right, so I'm gonna continue on to another page. I'm gonna rewrite my equation because question seven has a lot of information to it. So question seven. So our equation was Rx equal to x plus two all over x, x plus nine. So to find the vertical asymptotes, all you have to do is set the denominator equal to zero. Okay, so let me fix that. I meant to put a colon. So x, x plus nine equals zero. And we separate those out. x equals zero and x plus nine equals zero. And notice you end up with the same numbers that we talked about with the domain and that's a good thing because the domain and the vertical asymptotes match that means we're not going to have any holes in our rational graph in our rational function there will be no holes because the vertical asymptotes match the domain If the vertical asymptotes and the domains did not match, whoever is missing from the vertical asymptotes that is in the domain, that's a hole at the graph, and we would work with that accordingly. So now we know the vertical asymptotes. Let's talk about the horizontal slash oblique asymptotes. So we got to do the same thing that we did earlier. We got to take and we need to FOIL or basically distribute in the bottom. We need to know what we're working with. So x times x is x squared. x times 9 is 9x. And on the numerator, we still got the x plus 2. So again, to do these, we need the numerator degree, which is 1, because that's the power that's right there. We need the denominator degree, which is 2. And we're right back to that case 1 that we talked about earlier. Case one is when the numerator is less than the denominator. So that means you have a horizontal asymptote. Okay. And it is at y equals zero because case one is always y equals zero. And that means the oblique asymptote does not exist. There is none. Okay. So now we can go answer those questions real quick. So if we're looking at this. It has three vertical asymptotes. Well, that's not true. So we know it's not A. So moving to the next page. Has two vertical asymptotes? Absolutely. The left asymptote is X equals negative nine. The right asymptote is X equals zero. Just put them in order. The left one is the smallest one. The right one is the largest one. So you'd select B, X equals zero, X equals negative nine. This answer, I'm not going to answer until I get the graph. 
okay? Because the graph is going to help us answer this question right there about what's going on at the asymptotes. So horizontal asymptote. So for the horizontal, there was only one, and it was y equals zero. So you'd select A, put y equals zero on the blank. The oblique asymptote, you would select none. Okay? And now it says determine the points, if any, at which R intersects the horizontal asymptote. So we need to go back and check that because even though we didn't talk about it in 5.3, it is possible. We needed to check the intersection to see if R if we can actually cross this horizontal asymptote because it is possible to cross horizontal and oblique asymptotes, okay? So, we're gonna take that asymptote of zero and set it equal to our equation, x plus two, and I'm gonna use the factored, or the foiled one, all over x squared plus 9x. All this is is a proportion, so you cross multiply. So x times x squared plus 9x, that all becomes zero. And one times x plus two becomes x plus two. Subtract two, subtract two, x is equal to negative two. So this means that we will intercept the horizontal asymptote. And it will happen at negative two, comma, what was the y value? Zero. So we will actually go through the horizontal asymptote at negative two, zero. So that's what this question is asking. The graph, so we'll select A, and the graph of R intersects the horizontal or the oblique and then in here, you will put negative two comma zero. Okay? And then now, it says use the real zeros to divide the graph. Okay? And we want to know when we're above or below the x-axis. We'll get to this question here in a moment because, again, it's better to have the graph. In which down here, you'll notice the last step is to actually select the graph. Okay? So let's go ahead and let's use this information to help us select which graph it's going to be, okay? So in order to do this, we're now going to look at intervals. We're going to create intervals. And these intervals are all about the vertical asymptotes, the x-intercepts, and the domain values that we throw out. Okay, so our vertical asymptotes was negative 9 and 0. We had an x-intercept at negative 2, if I remember correctly. Sorry, I've lost my place in my notes. There it is. We had an x-intercept at negative 2, so I'm going to put that right in here. Um, and then the domain values match the vertical asymptotes, so we don't have to worry about that. So now I need to pick a number that is less than negative 9. So I'm going to choose negative 10. I'm going to pick a value that's between negative 9 and negative 2. So I'm going to make it easy on myself and do negative 3. And I'm going to pick a value between negative 2 and 0. I'm going to choose 1 negative one, sorry. I'm going to pick a value above zero. So I'm going to choose a one. What we want to do is we want to take these values and we want to plug them in to our original equation up here, either one of these, and we want to know what the values are because I want some extra points that are going to help me graph. So I'm going to plug negative 10 plus two all over negative 10 times negative 10 plus nine. And now I'm going to plug in the negative 3. Oops, you can't see it. So I plugged in the negative 10 where all those x's were. And they're going to have negative 3 plus 2 all over negative 3 times negative 3 plus 9. And then I'll have negative 1 plus 2 all over negative 1 times negative 1 plus 9. 
And then I will have 1 plus 2 all over 1 times 1 plus 9. Okay? So I'm going to go to my calculator to run all of these. I'm just going to let the calculator kick out the answer because I want to know what it is really quick. So alpha y equals, and we've got negative 10 plus 2 all over negative 10 times negative 10 plus 9. That's just how it was written on my paper. Hit enter. And now we know what happens at negative 10. At negative 10, we are at negative 4 fifths. And negative 4 fifths, we do want the decimal of that. Negative 4 divided by 5 is negative 0 0.8 because we're going to be graphing. We need that value. Okay, so this is what I just wrote up. So at negative 10, we know we are at negative 10 comma negative 0.8. And now we're going to do the same thing for the rest of the values. So I'm going to scroll back up, grab that fraction, because all I want to do is turn it at that negative 10 into a negative 3 now. Okay. 3, delete off the 0, scroll down. Negative 3, delete off the 0, scroll over, delete off the 0, and turn that into a negative 3. And now we know what happens at negative 3. At negative 3, we are at 1 18th. Well, 1 divided by 18 is 0 0.05 repeating. Okay, now we go in and we plug in the negative 1. So I'm going to again scroll up, just grab what I need, and all I'm going to do is change that 3, negative 3, into the negative 1. 1 and 1. Hit enter, and we know that at negative 1, it goes at negative 1 8. And negative 1 divided by 8 gives us negative 0 0.125. And then last but not least, I'm going to go back up, grab that same fraction again, and I'm going to change all the negatives into positive ones. Just delete that piece out. Delete and delete. And we end up with? One happening at three tenths. Okay? And three divided by ten is point three. Okay? Because again, you can double check that, but I'm pretty sure. Point three. Now, a faster way that we could have done this, just so you know, because you can do that, you could have gone in here and put in your X um I know many of you are like, why didn't you show this from the beginning? Because I wanted to show you both ways. X plus 2 all over X and then X plus 9. Graph. So there's what it looks like. So now you can actually go in and see that picture. And just know you know on your graph, this continues on down. This continues on up. It doesn't stop there at these points because there's actually a vertical asymptote. Remember, that's x equals 0. That's right there. Okay? But if you go to your second graph and look at the table, now you have all those answers we just came about. 1 was 3 tenths. Negative 1 was negative 1 eighth. Negative 3 was 1 eighteenth. And scroll up, negative 10 was negative 4 fifths. So right there was all the answers too. Either way, it's all good. Okay? So the reason why we did this is so that we can now use all this information to help us graph. Okay? So let's take a look at what this graph actually looks like. So I'm going to draw a big y-axis, a big x-axis. Okay? The first thing you're going to want to graph is the x-intercepts and y-intercepts. So we have an x-intercept at negative 2. And again, I'm just sketching 
So it doesn't really bother me if this is not to scale. There's no Y intercept. The next thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to, be going to want to put in our vertical asymptotes and horizontal. So our vertical asymptotes, one of them is X equals zero, and that's
So I'm below, I'm below, I'm below, I'm below, I'm below, I'm below. All of a sudden right here at zero, we're back at the x-axis. So from negative four to zero, my graph is all below. And again, do I like being at zero, which is on the x-axis? Our sign says no. So you would have a parenthesis. So this is what that first piece looks like. From negative four to zero, we are below. And again, the parentheses because we are less than, okay? But also notice that after zero, we're back below again, right? So after zero, we are back below. And where does that go? That moves on towards infinity. Again, this is all about X values. So as we continue this way, my graph is always going to be below, okay? And so this, because we're using interval notation, this is where instead of commas, you'll put a union between those two. And this is what that answer looks like, okay? This is where we are below the x-axis, less than zero. All right. So moving on to question nine. Oh, and question eight, that's all coming from 8.5, as well as question nine and question 10 is all from, sorry, I said 8.5, 5.5. Question eight is from 5.5, and so is question nine and question 10, okay? So let's go look at question nine and question 10. <clears throat> Get rid of what I had there, all right. So question nine wants us to solve this. So x cubed minus 5x squared greater than zero. So in order to solve this, all you care about is finding what we call critical values. And the critical values for this are all about what the x-intercepts are. That's what you need to find. So in order to find the x-intercepts for this, we need to factor. Okay? Well, the factoring on this is pretty easy because both of these share in x squared okay so again we're looking for critical values and all we're going to do is factor this both of them share in x squared or x's and the most that we can pull out is actually x squared it's just a gcf type factoring and if i pull out an x squared well there were three x's i pulled two out that leaves me with x there were two x's i pulled two out so that leaves me with just the negative five and again, I'm going to set this equal to zero because I don't care about this until the very end when I want to answer the question. So now that this is factored, all we're going to do is set these equal to zero. So x squared equals zero. x minus five equal to zero. So how do you get rid of something squared? You would square root it. And x is equal to, normally we would say x equals plus or minus zero. But because zero is neither positive nor negative, you can just call it x equals zero. Over here, x is equal to five. Now we know the x-intercepts, and that's the important part. And now we're gonna set up intervals like what we did on question seven to help us graph. And our intervals are gonna be all about those x-intercepts. So we have an x-intercept at zero, and we have an x-intercept at five. And so this has created intervals for us. So we need to pick a number that is below zero. Let's choose negative one. We'll keep it easy on ourselves. We need to pick a number above between zero and five. I'm going to choose one. And we need to pick a number above five. I'm going to choose six. Now, the difference between this and what we did before is before we wanted to know the number. And here, all we want to know is, is this answer positive or negative? So when I take negative one and plug it in, I wanna know is this answer positive or negative? When I take the positive one and plug it in, I wanna know is this answer positive or negative? And when I take the six and plug it in, all I care about is whether this answer is positive or negative, okay? So we go to our calculator. I can clear this out now. Let's just clear that out. So we got negative one 
cubed minus 5 times negative 1 squared. So that's the answer. So we found out that the negative 1 side is a negative answer. Okay? So all I'm going to do is go back up there and grab that. Bring it on down. And I'm going to put in a positive 1 this time. So I'm just going to delete out the negatives. Scrolling over. Delete out the negative. And there's our answer. So we found that the, the positive 1 also produces a negative answer. And then last but not least, I'm just going to go up there and grab that again. And I'm going to go back through and I'm going to plug in 6 for the 1s. 6. And we produce a positive answer. Okay? So here's what we know. The negative 1 gave us a negative answer. The positive 1 gave us a negative answer. The 6 gave us a positive answer. Now we can answer the question. So the question is, when are we greater than zero? So that means we want to know when are we positive. That's what we want. When is x positive? So if we come down here and look, here is when the x value gave us positives. So what is this interval? It starts at 5 and it goes on towards infinity because there's nothing else over here that stops it. Now the question is, are they brackets or parentheses? Well, of course, the infinity gets parentheses. This is where you look at the symbol. Our symbol is greater than. So since it's not an equal to, this answer will be a parentheses around the 5. And that is the answer to the problem. That's what you will put in the blank. Parentheses, 5, comma, infinity, parentheses. Because that's where we have all the positive answers. So parentheses, 5, comma, infinity, parentheses. Last question, and that's it. We did it. Yay! We made it. So this time it's a rational. Okay? But notice we're not equal to zero. That's heartbreaking because it makes things so much easier when we're equal to zero. So let's just fix this. Let's make it equal zero. So how do I move a positive one to the other side. Well, we're going to subtract it. And we're going to have x plus 5 all over x minus 13 minus 1, less than or equal to 0. Now, this is a good thing. Now, just like what we did before in problem number, I think it was 6 when we did that. Let me double check. Problem number 5. We need to put these together. I need these together. Okay, so let's put this information together. So in order to do that, remember this is over one. So we need a common denominator. This time the common denominator is even easier. It's going to be x minus 13. So notice these already match. So that gives us x plus five on top. Notice in here, this is one. I need x minus 13. So this guy's got to get multiplied by x minus 13 on top. Okay? So that gives us x minus 13 on top. Because 1 times all that is just x minus 13. Now we know what the common denominator is. All we need to do is combine like terms across the top. You got to be careful because of the subtraction. That we are subtracting off all of that x minus 13. So that gives you x plus 5 minus x plus 13 on top. That's what you're really looking at. Okay? And of course, all this is still less than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 0. Combining like terms, x minus x cancels. 5 and 13 Give us 18 over x minus 13, less than or equal to 0. This is the real rational we're working with. And from here on out, this is what we're going to handle. Okay? Do not go back to the original.
So now we need to find those critical values. The critical values for this are all about x-intercepts, vertical asymptotes, and domain values that are excluded. Okay? So, in order to find those x-intercepts, this is why we had to combine all this together. To find x-intercepts, we set the numerator equal to 0. So, 18 equals 0. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So, that means, because that doesn't make any sense, that there are no x-intercepts. Okay? The domain of this, we set the denominator equal to 0. So x minus 13 equals 0. So x is equal to 13. So the domain is every number but 13. Okay? The vertical asymptotes, well, it's going to be the same as the domain because you just take the denominator, set it equal to 0. And you find that we've got a vertical asymptote of 13. So these are going to be what help us set up that interval that we now want to look at. So our interval is basically just going to revolve around the number 13. So I need a number below 13. Well, we're going to choose, let's make it easy. Let's choose zero because zero is easy to work with. Now, normally I know some of you probably pick 12, but thinking a number below 13, zero is really easy to work with. Now, a number above 13, that's where I will, I will definitely use 14. And again, all we're going to do is we're going to plug into that equation that we found right here. And I want to see what happens. All I want to know is what the sign is. So we're going to have 18 over 0 minus 13. And then over here, we'll have 18 over 14 minus 13. And again, all I care about is the sign. So alpha y equals 18 over 0 minus 13. And we get a negative number. And then if we do the other one, I'm just going to go right back up and grab that. And all I'm going to do is come down here and change the 0 to a 14. And we get a positive number. So now we can answer the question and finally be done with this exam. So the question says, when are we less than or equal to 0? That's the important part. So that means we want negative answers. We want negative answers. So up here, on which side of 13 are we negative? And it's this side. So that interval is negative infinity to 13. That's a parenthesis. Now, you have to remember what 13 was. Remember, this is a value that we threw out. It's also a vertical asymptote. And because it's a vertical asymptote, that means we do not like it. No matter what this symbol says, even if it's an equal to, so that should be a bracket, but because it's a vertical asymptote, we can't touch that number. So this is a parenthesis, and that is the final answer. Vertical asymptotes, numbers that you throw out of the domain, they have to have parentheses if you're writing the interval for them. Okay? So be careful on that. And so that's where we would go into our, our test. We'll put a parenthesis, negative infinity, comma 13, parenthesis. And that is our module four test for review. Enjoy.